The Entrepreneur's Library, episode 231. Welcome to the Entrepreneur's Library, the only book-centric podcast that reviews all the top-selling business books and shares authors' perspective firsthand. This is your resource to finding the next great book that will enable you to grow personally and professionally. Welcome your host, Wade Danielson. Welcome back to the EL. Today we have Marlene Chisholm, author of No Drama Leadership. How Enlightened Leaders Transform Culture in the Workplace. This was a this was a phenomenal interview, and I actually had a chance to talk with Marlene a little bit afterwards, and she was telling me some of her background. And it was interesting because until the age of 40, she was working in a in a craft factory. And so she comes from a lot of different experience. She comes from from having experience with being an employee, being the 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 manager, and then also being the owner. And so uh, her perspective is fantastic. I think you guys will get a ton out of this interview. So let's bring on Marlene. Welcome, Marlene. And thank you for joining us on the Entrepreneur's Library. Thank you. Before we take a deep dive into your book, No Drama Leadership, will you take just a moment to introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about you personally. Thank you, Wade. My name is Marlene Chisholm, and I'm a consultant, international speaker, and the author of three books. Two of them were commercially published. The first one was published by Wiley, and it's entitled Stop Workplace Drama. And the subtitle is Train Your Team to Have No Complaints, No Excuses, and No Regrets. And my most recent book, published by Bibliomotion, is entitled No Drama Leadership, How Enlightened Leaders Transform Culture in the Workplace. Excellent. So let's let's do that. Thanks for sharing that. And now let's jump right into that book that you just talked about, No Drama Leadership, which was just made available for purchase at the beginning of this month, May 2015. And uh, Marlene, we're going to move quickly, but today we're here to cover those top questions that our listener and, and future reader would like to get answered. And the first one is, what was the inspiration behind writing No Drama Leadership? You know, the inspiration uh, to author No Drama Leadership came from actually my first book and the success of of it, Stop Workplace Drama. You know, those who went kind of crazy for that book, that included the private practice administrators, the small business owners, and then in the corporate world, it included the frontline supervisors all the way up to middle-level managers or directors. And what I found is that most, most of these groups of people never really receive any real leadership development, or if they did, it was just kind of canned, or it was more about what we often call the hard skills and not what I call critical skills. So I was inspired to write this book for the upper-level executives and business owners, not only for their own development, but to see from the mountaintop, so to speak, why we need to change the definition of leadership and include that definition to include all levels of leaders within the company. So Marlene, this is one of my favorite questions because there's, there's a sea of books out there and we're trying to, or, you know, the haystack and every book is a needle. So we're trying to help differentiate and kind of pull that needle out of the haystack. So what makes your book different from others regarding the same or similar topic? You know, wait, it's just, it's some of what I just mentioned, that definition of leadership to be all inclusive for all levels in that, you know, we start to work as, as leaders with the environment to change the identity of those even in the, those first levels like supervisors, new leaders, so that they more easily identify with being a leader versus just seeing it as those at the top, those executives, we start to shift culturally the perception of what leadership is. And I think another differentiation is that I am a female who's writing about leadership not only, not from, not from a feminine perspective, but really from a universal perspective. And that at the core, leadership is as much about a way of being and not just a way of doing, especially in the world in in which we are living today. So what I say is that it's a both and world. We've really not taught people how to be. It's kind of like we need to get back to character simply because of the transparency. You know, I often say that transparency is not a choice anymore. It's a given. And the way that we're going to protect our companies, the way that we're going to really move our companies forward is to develop more enlightened leaders. And so that's some of the things that I'm attempting to introduce in this book. So Marlene, this next question is more on structure. And that's, you know, how did you design the book? Can it be read from front to back? Or is that how you designed it? Or can someone actually jump in and jump out cherry picking information as needed? You know, they, they really could. They could jump into any chapter, but I but I have designed it to where it all works together. And so there's a lot of different ways for a reader to engage with this book. 
truly they could look at the end of each chapter. Um, I have what I call wisdom exercises and executive summaries. So for the busy person who wants to kind of get a glimpse of the, the thoughts, they could look at the end of each chapter and there's questions in the wisdom exercises. That's to build awareness, to actually ask a question for people to be thinking about their own leadership or the leadership of the whole organization. So you can look at it from very different perspectives. But the book was designed to be used in a variety of ways. I noticed that a lot of people with my first book, they used it in discussion groups and, and uh, you know, people built their own book club. So I thought, you know what, even though this book is at a higher level, I want to design it so that, you know, any level of leader could actually use this and see from different perspectives. So you could do a book club and then you could at the end of each chapter, let's say you met once a month or every other week, you could go back at the end of the chapter and then there's an easy facilitation discussion using those guides that I just told you about. Um, you know, that executive summary and the wisdom exercises. Or if as an individual, you are building a company and you are now having employees and you're starting to train some of your leaders or you're starting to see the need for leadership development, you could actually read through this book and get some ideas about where to start. So you could use this as an individual, as an owner, or you could use it as a leader at any position and do and do a, a book club. So Marley, now that we know a little of the purpose, the background behind the book, let's go ahead and take a deep dive into the content itself. This is my favorite part. This is where we can really lay out, uh, you know, what the future, the, the listener and the future reader can get out of the book. So we take the next five to eight minutes and do just that. Absolutely. Well, the book is divided into three sections. The sections are the will to be, the eyes to see, and the power to create. And so that's sort of the what I would call the universal or the spiritual component of the book. Um, and in that way, sometimes I'll create keynotes off of those, of, of just those three sections. In the will to be the first section, I'm making the statement that the enlightened leader has the will to be aligned, aware, and accountable. And I really talk a lot about will versus willingness, desire, and so on, because what I have learned is that you can't want something for someone that they don't want for themselves. If there is no desire to be a certain way, if a, if a leader does not claim their values, there's really nothing to align to. So alignment, awareness, and accountability all work together. Alignment being a major, major component that threads throughout the entire book with the understanding that before alignment comes clarity, and I talked a lot about that in Stop Workplace Drama, that until I'm clear about how I want to show up, about what my personal values are, about the clarity of the organization, until I have something to go to, I have no way to align. And that's why we have so many struggles nowadays with leadership and in our in our, our companies and corporations. I've made the um, the framework for awareness. There's a lot of ways to talk about consciousness or awareness. Many, many great books on that, but I've done it in a way that I think is really easy to grasp. And so I've d divided awareness into four different types of awareness. Self-awareness, other awareness, cultural awareness, and spiritual awareness. With spiritual awareness, not being about religion, but about your connection to the divine. And in that connection to the divine, it's the invisible realm, that understanding that there are connections, that there's invisible forces at play. And that has to do with your real connection to your values and how you want to show up, how you want to treat other people. And then finally, accountability. And I make a big distinction in this book between responsibility and accountability with the understanding that until there's real ownership, accountability just serves as a way for people to cheat and skew the numbers. If you look at anything in, in the news where we found out someone wasn't really being accountable, the Wall Street scandals that have gone on, the banking scandals, you start looking at accountability, there was no real ownership. There was no sense of responsibility. And accountability then became a way just to look good, to skew the numbers. When people truly accept ownership, through responsibility, accountability becomes a, a wonderful tool to course correct quickly, which leads to the next section, eyes to see. The idea here is that enlightened leaders have what I call supervision versus supervision. So it's a little bit of a play on words, but the idea is that enlightened leaders have a, a sort of a sixth sense about how to see things. And so they see differently. They see communication differently. So instead of calling it a soft skill and seeing it as sort of a nice to have 
Um, we don't really, we don't need it. It's not really necessary, but it's just kind of nice to have. Really enlightened leaders are very committed to their communication. They see it as a critical skill. They see it in and of itself, a strategy. Understanding that from the bigger perspective, it's better to get along with people. It's better to be upfront about your intentions. It's better to just try to understand the other point of view versus all of the reactive and, and manipulative communication that we've used to try to have short-term gains. They also see course correction not as something that's inconvenient or something to avoid, to skew the numbers, to look good to the public. They see course correction when done every day, when looked at from the magnifying glass. They see it as a competitive advantage. And I talk a lot about why companies or individuals fail to course correct quickly. And kind of an interesting uh, analogy that I make is that, you know, we all love the hero's journey. We love to watch the biggest loser. We love to watch a person that has allowed their weight to get up to 400, 500 pounds. And we love to cheer them on and see the challenges they have of getting back into a healthy weight. But the reality is course correcting quicker at 25 pounds overweight, 50 pounds overweight, it would really take away a lot of that big hero's journey. And so it's it's not that sexy to course correct. It's just, it's habit, it's being honest, it's aligning. Um, and, and so course correction goes back with the idea of alignment from the perspective that there's only two ways to align. You can either tell yourself the truth or you can or you can constantly course correct. So alignment truly is about small course corrections all the time. And then finally, they have the eyes to see change as a catalyst for leadership growth. And in the book, I talk about the four quadrants of change that happens with one spectrum on the vertical, vertical plane being wanted versus unwanted change. And then on the horizontal plane, um, when you're drawing those four squares on the horizontal plane, you have expected and unexpected. And when you start to look at those four quadrants, you can see clearly that maybe as a leader or the owner of a corporation, you may be in quadrant one where it was expected and wanted, but because you didn't communicate for your employees, that change seems unexpected and unwanted. And that's where you're going to have conflict. So these levels of change can tell you all about your, your leadership and where you need to grow. And then finally, the last chapter is the power to create. And the understanding here is that enlightened leaders see themselves as co-creators or creators, and they see other people that way as well. So they work collectively to create the right environment, the right engagement, and the right empowerment. And I think that there's some interesting concepts in, in the environment uh, chapter that will be new to any reader. I've taken from, uh, and I, I like to take from other disciplines and concepts and relate these to leadership, but in the, in the um, chapter on environment, I took from Dr. Bruce Lipton, who taught medical students, and, and uh, he taught how the environment works to support the cells. And some of his study was that you know, in biology, cells thrive in healthy environments and cells try to avoid toxic environments. So I've got a section in the book where I have some of his teachings and then we replace the word cells with people so that you can start to see the impact the environment has on living beings that are working to help you implement the strategy and to serve your customers. Um, engagement. The idea here is that engagement, we've got it all wrong. It's really not a project or a checklist. Engagement is a symbiotic relationship between the employee and the company. They are giving their gifts because it's it's taking from them something that they want to give. And in, in return, the company gets an exchange. It's an exchange of value for value. And then empowerment, I really talk a lot about what is power and how we express either from a place of power or a place of disempowerment and, and how to recognize that. So that's the overview of the book. You probably don't even need to buy it now. There it is in a nutshell. <laughs> <laughs> you did a fantastic, fantastic job. And like you said, you just put everything down in a nutshell. And that's why I feel like this next question is sometimes difficult to answer. And then I'm asking you to take it even a step further. And that if, if, uh, if the reader could only take away one concept, one principle or action item out of your entire book, everything you just broke down with us in the last couple of minutes, what would you personally want that to be? I would want that to be the understanding that if if today's leadership 
And I'm not talking about in the past how leadership was from some, you know, someone that was a, a, a colonel in the army or how leadership was back in the day. For today's leadership, if it's about anything, it is about alignment. That is what I would want people to take from this book. That's fantastic. And Marlene, there's several, I mean, even, even what you just said, there's some quote worthy things that you talked about throughout your book. And that's actually the next question. Do you have a favorite quote from your book? Something that you wrote, um, that, uh, that you feel like will re resonate or already has, I know it's only been out for a short period of time, but, uh, that's resonate with the audience. Will you take a second to explain what that quote means? I do. I have four. Can I share all of them? <laughs> Absolutely. So the first quote is if the company sees the employee as a cog in the wheel, the employee sees the company as a paycheck. So that's a symbiotic relationship there. And then I've said this already, but there's only two ways to align, and that's to tell the truth about your real values or course correct until your behaviors align with your values. My third quote is, you cannot produce accountable employees when the boss has an irresponsible mindset. And my fourth quote is really for the individual because there's individual readers. And I hear this all the time. The us versus them mentality works both ways. I hear so often, you know, employees criticizing their company. Oh, they don't provide leadership for me. They don't provide this. They don't provide that. So here's my, my favorite quote. It's out of alignment to criticize a company that does not have a budget for development if you aren't willing to invest a few dollars on a book, CD, or retreat that could elevate your skills and change your life. That is absolutely huge. That is one of the, you know, as a, as a business owner, that is one of the toughest things that I've had a challenge with is some people saying that they want help. And uh, so, so Marley, I, I usually don't interject here, but one time, uh, we were really trying to figure out how to increase, you know, sales and productivity within the company. And, and we tried several different ways. And, and, uh, one of the things that we, we walked into a meeting, we said, okay, how do you guys, how does someone become successful? And so they started to talk about these different things, you know, uh, well, you, they read books, successful people go to conferences, successful people come early, stay late. You know, they start naming off all this stuff. And then we said, okay, this is your list. What on this list are you doing? I love that. And, and you know, I love that. <laughs> it was, uh, it was, it got quiet. <laughs> well, you know what? You're just bringing up the point that I make about see yourself as a creator. If when you are a creator, you take responsibility. You see, accountability is saying, well, the boss told me to go to these three things and I can check that off the list. I have yeah. a witness that said, yes, I did. And now I'm certified. Responsibility is I went on my own. The company couldn't afford it this year or they don't provide for that, but I know who I am and who I want to be. And from that sense of self, I choose, like I have heard people with PhDs say, I can't go to the conference next year because my company won't pay the three or $400 for them to, and I'm like, really? You are an educated being. And, and so my point is that if you're not happy with your company and you're criticizing them, develop yourself, figure out a way to do it, and then you will find the company that aligns with your desire for development. It works hand in hand. Yeah, that is absolutely huge. That is, uh, that is fantastic. So Marley, this next question, we'll move away from your book just a little bit. And really here, we're not asking for any recommendation. We're asking for the book recommendation. So uh, we're looking for a book that you would suggest based on the way that it's changed your life, maybe created a, a lifestyle or a paradigm shift for you. Do you have a book that you could recommend? I have so many. I am a voracious reader. So rather than one, I, I have three that's top of mind, but there's Great. there's literally dozens. And some of them are not even business books. But the business books that I could recommend or that will help you in your business, The Power of Full Engagement by Jim Lohr and Tony Schwartz. It's, it's a fairly old book. I mean, it's seven or eight, 10 years old, but I love that book. It is fantastic. Um, they talk about how it's about energy, not about time. And uh, I think we're now starting to open up to these kinds of thoughts even more. So I would recommend revisiting that if you've already read it. I love Your Brain at Work by David Rock, full of neuroscience, how to, to understand how the brain works. This tells you why you feel fear whenever you're talking to your boss. This tells you why you do certain things, that you start to understand your brain versus thinking that you can work against the structures that, that you really can't work against. And then I love Mindset by Carol Dweck. And I really gained a lot from her in writing this book to understand that it helped me to understand the difference between 
accountability and why we all are afraid of accountability because if we don't have a learning mindset, we start getting into the fear of judgment. And the fear of judgment is from a fixed mindset of, well, if I didn't succeed the first time, it must mean that I'm stupid versus saying, you know what, I'm learning, have certain skills and certain talents that I'm learning. And when we take a learning mindset, it changes your whole life. Thank you for those recommendations. I love uh, adding books to the list. Actually, I you know, more than adding books to the list, I love checking them off the list, but uh, that doesn't happen as quickly as they get added. So <laughs> the list continues to grow. But Marlene, before we depart, can you recommend the best way for our listeners to not only get more information on you, but also get more information on your book, No Drama Leadership? Absolutely. There's all kinds of information on my, my website, marlenechism.com. That's M-A-R-L-E-N-E-C-H. ISM.com. You can also obviously get it at Barnes and Noble or um, Amazon. You can email me if you want more information about what I do, a same domain name, Marlene at MarleneChism.com. You can call me at 417-831-1799. You can connect with me on LinkedIn or I have resources for the first and second level supervisors at the other blog and website, which is www.stopworkplacedrama.com. So I like to offer a lot of of free things so that people can get to know me, make sure it's a match. And uh, I just invite people to connect with me. Excellent. Thank you so much for doing that and everything that you talked about. So the quotes that you mentioned, the books, um, the, the different resources and links, on how to get more information uh, on you and your book will all be in the show notes at the elpodcast.com so uh, that the, the the mobile listeners that are out there right now working out, running, what what have you, can, uh, can go back and check all that out. But more than anything, Marlene, thank you for coming on and sharing your book with us today. Wait, thank you so much for having me. Thanks again for listening in today. If you would like more information on Marlene or her book, No Drama Leadership, check out the show notes at the elpodcast.com. And if you would like to, uh, again, if you're an entrepreneur and you'd like to possibly be featured on our show as someone who uh, reading has changed your life. So if you have an awesome story about how that's happened, uh, connect with me at Wade D. Danielson on Twitter. Direct message me and let me know your story. I would love to uh, connect with you and, and get you featured, your business, your uh, uh, your story featured on the on the um, an upcoming episode of the EL. Looking for your next book idea? Head over to the elpodcast.com where Wade shares his amazing resource, the top 10 business books recommended by over 500 entrepreneurs with you for free. That's the elpodcast.com. Till the next time, keep it on the EL.